Hi again, everybody. Uh, we end with the grand finale. Um, so pleased and so glad to have Simon Sponberg from Georgia Tech with us for the third and final talk this evening. Take it away, Simon. Okay, great. And so thanks, Orit and uh, Sri. I, I think this is the first time I've been invited to give a talk with the word history in it, which I think officially makes me old. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, but no, I think this is a wonderful way to explore perspectives. And actually, that's the key thing uh, that I want to talk about a little bit is uh, perspectives is I think if I sort of try and capture one word that sort of has motivated a lot of what I think about and how my life has been shaped and shifted. Um, it's all about perspectives. And for if you go to like my website or if you've heard a talk from my lab, you'll know that I do a lot of work with animal movement. And that's a theme that's very important to me. I think animal movement is a wonderful way to sort of try and shift your perspective because even with small brains, these insects, for example, are able to fly quite sophisticatedly. And sometimes uh, they can even notice things that you might not be able to notice. And actually some of that comes from the neuroscience, but some of it comes from their physics as well, just the different kinds of things that their eyes can be tuned to, such as really rapid detection of motion. Uh, and things like that. So for example, this video actually is still playing. I don't know if you've noticed that yet, but um, there's actually another animal in that video. And that dragonfly saw that animal, of course, and was able to avoid it. Now, this has always fascinated me, but my perspective when I sort of bring up videos like this is people think one of two things. First of all, one is that they think that I'm very interested in movement and locomotion, and that's fair, I am, but that's not actually really what I'm so fascinated in. I'm really fascinated in uh, the brains of animals um, and our different and our own brains shape the perspectives of the world that we have. And I'm profoundly struck by all the things that we don't see and all the things that we don't perceive. And the fact that if I start running, the way that my brain works fundamentally changes. You actually see things that you didn't see before because of the way that the neuromodulators act on your eyes. So biology has this enormous complexity in it, right? The easiest thing to say is that biology is more complex than the way that you're thinking about it. And, and that's, 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 that's fine and good, but how can we sort of make some sense of that is sort of what I've wanted to try and understand. And I've sort of always been interested at this level uh, this very tangible level of the organism, in part because I am one, right? And I'm very interested in that. But the other perspective that sometimes people think that I have is that I must love insects because I always show videos like that. And like, the, here's a closer up of the, uh, I thought I'd show a fair number of videos since it's later in the evenings of the, uh, of the dragonfly flying away. And you notice the frog even jumps up and despite not catching the dragonfly, it still tries to push something into its mouth, right? So there's a lot of interesting things there. And just watching these videos can spark so much curiosity and interest. Um, and in fact, it's a wonderful way to bring people into the lab and into science. But the other thing that people think is that I must really love insects, and that's absolutely not true. So going back to um, something from my childhood, I actually had a very traumatic experience with one of these guys with the cicada when I was six. And I have no particularly love of insects. Um, I, I was looking at a branch and there was an in, uh, cicada behind its uh, exoskeleton that it was shedding and its eyes lit up bright red and it's buzzed and I still have dreams about that sometimes. So I have no particular fondness of insects. It's not like I went off to try and study insects as a particular love, love affair, but it is a perspective that uh, I have found and come to that is sort of an interesting system. And I don't actually define myself through the organisms that I study. That's something that we sometimes see a little bit more in, uh, in, in some aspects of biology. But to sort of show how I got there um, as sort of the living history, this is where I grew up. I grew up in Missoula, Montana. Um, uh, this is a picture I took relatively recently when I was back there in winter, so it's quite cold there. Um, but uh, my parents, my father is a professor of Buddhist studies and my mom is um, uh, studies diabetes um, and is an educator in that space. And so I had sort of the academic side, but from a very different perspective, uh, Buddhist studies, uh, Buddhism has a very strong history of inquiry, but it's not at all like the scientific inquiry. So I always have interesting discussions with him about different modes of inquiry. Um, and my mom really was sort of the one who introduced me into the science side of things. When I left Missoula, I went to a really tiny little uh, undergraduate uh, institution and I, I tried to find some picture of me there. Uh, this is the best I could do. Uh, Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon, which only has 1600 students. So many of your high schools may have been bigger than that. Um, 
but when I went to Lewis and Clark and I went there mostly because it was the place that offered me the most money so that I would have to pay the least and then go into the least amount of debt, right? And that's, I think, a big motivation that we should remember in a lot of cases for um, trying to sort of think about our undergraduate uh, experiences. When I went there, I started in physics. And I was really excited about physics as sort of these, uh, for a lot of the ways I think we sort of get into um, as, as early students, you know, the language of mathematics is an elegant way to do it. And when it's connected to um, uh, ontology and, and the reality of the world, is, as Peter said in the previous talk, it's a really, really powerful tool. And I sort of worked with two biophysicists there, Michael and Beth, and got sort of exposed to it. But at the time, a lot of biophysics was still at that cell and molecular scale. And that got very frustrating for me. I really like classical mechanics and I liked it. And I, you know, I was told oftentimes that there was, didn't seem to be much to do there. You could sort of get into nonlinear dynamics. It was still sort of, you know, it was just after chaos was sort of having its heyday and all that kind of thing. Um, but really coming back to sort of making it tangible about uh, the biological world, how that, that bridge hadn't been uh, traversed that much. And so I, I actually got very frustrated in physics and I totally left. I did my first, uh, I got a degree in physics from Lewis and Clark, but I also pretty much halfway through, I switched over and got a degree in biology because that's where I actually found that there was something interesting that we can do with physics at the organismal scale. Um, this is a totally not the perspective to have now. I think the perspective has changed, by the way, just to prelude where I'm going. But I worked with this guy, Keller Autumn, who's actually a mathematician by training and then became a biologist. Um, and we sort of studied how geckos stick by Van der Waals forces. And I thought that was a really cool sort of bridging from, uh, you know, a, a phenomenon that ultimately has some quantum mechanical origins uh, because of the polarizability and up to the organismal level. But I that sort of embrace, it, it, the education was the big thing here. The real reason I switched is that Keller caught a very in, impressive class that was all about trying to do something totally new. You basically, you got an A if you discovered something new and it was about inquiry-based class where we sort of learned techniques and physiology. It was a core physiology class and we tried to apply them and do new experiments and it was sort of wild and crazy and unhinged and it worked really, really wonderfully. And my sort of answer to Peter is that I think that's the kind of inquiry-based stuff that we need a little bit more in physics um, now because that really sort of pulled me fully away from physics. So much so that I have a confession to make. Um, oh. Uh, before I go on to that confession to just analyze that, the best thing I did in undergrad is that I left and went to China and I studied in Guilin, uh, China and Southern China here. And I just studied Chinese for a semester and traveled around. Um, and that totally changed my perspective, that world of sort of going into an entirely different culture, just sort of, sort of so fundamentally shifts how you're thinking about the world around you and how you interact with it, that these kinds of changing things that shake up your perspective is I think really important to come back to that word. But I have a confession to make, which is that I am maybe not a physicist by some standard definitions because my PhD doesn't say physics in it, it says integrative biology. And so my PhD was in the integrative biology department at Berkeley. And I describe integrative biology as choose your own adventure um, where you can create your own program. There's no required classes, but you can take a lot of classes in physics and engineering and biology around. And I worked with Bob Full, who is a really formative guy for me, uh, studying the science of motion um, and trying to get into how animals move. And from that, I went back and slowly progressed back towards physics. So I've actually sort of taken the inverse path here, uh, working first with Tom Daniel, who is in the Department of Biology and does, is an incredible biologist, but he did PDE theory at, at Caltech for his uh, postdoc. And Adrian Fairhall, who's a, a computational biophysicist, many of you may know. Uh, and um, so I was working in between their labs. And so it sort of brought me sort of closer back to physics. And now I'm actually in a physics department. So um, I think one thing that I could talk to more people off about line is I, I think this inverse path of where we go sort of degrees in physics, but coming back to or degrees in biology, coming back to physics is a different path, but that is happening now. And I think that's the one thing I will say about this as a whole is that nowadays there's so much interdisciplinary training. None of these people that I was trained by were trained in a single discipline and were across. So you can get this kind of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary training. And I think it's becoming more the norm. And so this kind of definitional space that we get into about what's defined as physics or out there is a, a bit dangerous and that's not to be too like grand unification of all fields um there is distinct perspectives to that and you want to bring those in but you want to sort of understand where they're coming from and specifically explore what their limits are and the last thing that i want to say in just the last minute is there's one very important perspective and person's perspective i haven't talked about yet which is the other thing that i want to mention which is my wife jenny mcguire <laughs> 
And I'm gonna talk about her for just a minute and I'll just introduce you to what she does. She studies climate uh, change and biodiversity. And so this is a map that she made uh, with a number of other people at the Nature Conservancy about how animals will dynamically shift across the landscape to track changing climate going into the future. So she does this pretty uh, sophisticated modeling of that, but she's much more adventurous than I do. Uh, then she actually goes to the field and studies it. So she rappels down into an eight story cave called Natural Trap Cave that animals have been walking over the top of, falling in and collecting as fossils for the last 100,000 years. And you rappel down eight stories into the cave and you dig up fossils and you can reconstruct ecosystems and actually check, test how uh, climate change has affected past ecosystem uh, dynamics uh, over time. And the reason why I spent so much time just talking about Jenny is first, she's incredibly important to me and has shaped a lot of my life. Second, she actually came from the same graduate program as me, despite the fact that we have, we have the same degree, even though we've gone in very different directions from there. And I think that shows you that you don't necessarily need to be defined by what you did in graduate school. But the last thing is, from an advice perspective, is I thought I would mention just something about being on a dual career path, because I think this is something that many of us uh, face, not all of us, but many of us come from, uh, especially these days, um, will have a partner or, um, or, or other situations where your career as an academic will be entwined with another academic's career. And, um, a couple of thoughts on that that I've tried to share because I talked to a lot of people about this is, um, first of all, I don't, uh, uh, we've given it a new name, uh, Akaduo, that I'm trying to get people to look. I like the sort of superhero idea that it, uh, it connects to. Um, my suggestion, if you are in this situation, is to always be an advocate for the other person. And that's exactly what I just did. I was talking about what Jenny was doing and trying to give a sense of her work and thinking about how you can uh, uh, both contribute to each other's uh, success. But the most important thing that I found when trying to navigate the realm of dual careers is that um, you really need to communicate well. And that means communicating where there is flexibility and where there isn't flexibility. The most difficult times I've seen where dual career situations have not worked out well, it's you, oftentimes there's a miscommunication of what people's needs are. What do they actually need in order to be happy? What will they be content with either between themselves or between them and the universities that they're trying to negotiate with? And where is their flexibility? How much can you do? What can you do around that? But there is a bit of a tendency to then get sort of to define yourself just as a, a duo, just as the tool person. So the duo part is important here, um, but the separation is important. And you'll find if you are in this situation, especially if you're a young um, professional in science, um, make sure you do define yourselves independently and that you're contributing separately. Even if you're in the same fields, it's nice to have some identity that is separated so that people have different associations with you. And finally, I, I know this is an extremely challenging situation and it doesn't always work, but it can. I want to emphasize the other word that we often, the other phrase we oftentimes use to describe these things is the two body problem, which I think is somewhat uh, funny because we as physicists should know the two body problem is actually pretty solvable. Um, it, it's a three body problem that's hard, right? Um, that's the right, and that, that's what's going to be facing me actually in, a, in about five months because we're expecting our first child. Um, so I'll see, I'll tell you, come invite me back next year and I'll tell you how I'm navigating the three body problem. But uh, the two body problem can work out, but it's a very difficult situation. And if I can be helpful for that or anyone else, um, please get in touch with me. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about it offline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. Um, Thank you on behalf of the audience. Thank you for a terrific talk. We have time for a couple of questions. Audience, please feel free to unmute and uh, go for it. Okay, so maybe I can start off with a question. Um, we have a shy audience. Um, you described this unusual path away from and then back to the physics department, right, as a biophysicist. Um, and I wonder if you often run into people who've had a similar experience, because I can't think of a different example. Mm. 
Um, there, there are a couple of other people who have gone that track. Allison Sweeney's done this as well. Um, there's and there's people who have done this in, in sort of a less maybe in, in a more roundabout ways um, instead of sort of having their actual PhD, say biology on it, but being employed in a physics department certainly goes the other way all the time, which I think is a fascinating comment, right? It, it really tells you a bit of the difference about classically about the disciplines. If you look at almost any large biology department in the in the states, you will find at least a couple of people who have a physics PhD, but rarely will you find it the other way around. And I think that's an interesting commentary. I can leave it to that and sort of talk about it a little bit. There's a lot that we think that sort of defines us as a physicist. And I think that can be very powerful, right? We share a common language and a common set of understanding. If you look at the physics curriculum at the undergraduate level, it's, it's quite uniform, uh, especially compared to biology. Um, and I, it's starting to be disrupted a little bit, um, but there is a strength in that, right? So it's a, if we can connect a new system that we're studying to some other kinds of set of systems that we've looked at before, there's a huge power in that because then we can bring all of the physics that we understand about this class of systems to bear on, uh, on that new system that we're looking at. But there is also, uh, I think the, the, the part that can be problematic is this if the tent gets too small. Um, and if we get too rigid and sort of thinking that this is this are what the bounds of physics are, this is how you have to do an inquiry in physics, is sort of as I think the previous talk was talking about a little bit. And um, that can certainly be a struggle, uh, as you mentioned in your in your previous question. I've certainly gotten that before, but I've actually gotten a lot of people who are, you know, I think much more on the on the side of being very engaged with it. And it's been very fun to come back to physics. Um, because now I think there is an organismal physics. There is a physics of living systems that can be done across many scales. We have the tools in physics to acquire at the level of complexity of physical world that we would see at the level of the organism. And I think it's a particularly fascinating place to look at because biological systems are composed of all this complexity and yet they're functional, right? Um, in many ways, not all aspects of organisms are functional, right? We know from evolutionary biology, but much of it is shaped towards function through evolution, right? And so the, the it's not just a random assemblage of parts. It's not just a random interaction from which emergence occurs. It's a functional interaction that's shaped through many, many, um, uh, many generations and with this process of natural selection. And I think that's something that I'm still, that sort of defines a lot of the work that I'm doing and that I think is really fun for a physics perspective on organismal biology, which is to understand how does complexity compose but a simplicity emerges such that we can still behave in a way that actually gets us around the world despite having millions of neurons hooked together to many other systems. And that's the deeply fascinating problem when I think requires some appreciation and, and inquiry at the level of the organism as well as at many other scales. Super, thanks so much. Uh, anybody else, if you have a question, now's the moment, go for it. Oh, Johan, go for it. I guess, I guess the sort of comment on what you just said, so I had a bit of a similar experience, right? I went from biology and then to the physics department and so forth. And at the time they were joking that I had broken the second law of thermodynamics by going that direction, that you can always go from math to physics and from physics to biology, but you can't go. And I think it's a, it's really, I think, a, even though that was kind of funny way to introduce, it's, it really shows there's a problem. Um, and maybe 30 years ago, where you can get a degree in physics and a degree in biology, uh, the labels meant something. But now there are so many programs and so many, uh, we get so many top students in our systems biology program. They come as in a sort of star of physics credentials coming in. Many times they work with a physicist, uh, but their PhD is not gonna say that. Uh, and I think my experience is that it's, it's getting better and better, but I think there's still probably some doors that are closed because of that. Um, I'm not sure what to do about it, but it's um, maybe it's just an old generation that's sort of making itself irrelevant anyways, but uh, I think that we should be proactive about it. Well, I think there's the other aspect of it, which is that if we look, uh, you know, that there, there, there is a danger in sort of viewing it, uh, this is, I don't think what you were saying at all, Johan, but there is a danger if we go too far in sort of viewing everything as just sort of grand unified unification, right? That every, everything is just science while well, I get trained multidisciplinarily. The sort of pitfalls of multidisciplinary training is that you sort of, you, everything sort of becomes one perspective that's just sort of be, supposed to be a mix of everything. I think we still have very strong specializations and areas that we go into. And I think the fun thing is actually trying to 
to see these different combinations. Now, now it's not so limited as like somebody brings the physics perspective and somebody brings the biophysics perspective. I think it's fun to try and explore, but well, what's the biological physics perspective that you bring and what's the biological physics perspective that you bring, right? More is different again. Um, and actually, I think one of the things that go, go back to the perspectives comment, one of the things that I always try and do in my collaborations and in my mentoring is I try and find the limitations of the others, uh, of the approach that I'm learning or that I'm uh, getting from somebody else. Not to be obnoxious about it, right? Not to say, ah, I found where that approach is limited. But I think by sort of understanding where there's limitations and advantages of the approach, then we sort of see where there's new opportunities for that frontier. So I try to do that pretty cognizantly, but I agree with you. I think these things are breaking down, but I do think it's interesting to explore what the new different perspectives are that different kinds yeah, of people can uh, bring, for example. Really, I think it's, yeah. I just think that the, there's certainly a huge difference uh, coming with a physics background, a biology background, I'm just saying um, people have to be a bit, less, a bit less lazy and not look at the label, but actually look at the work mm -hmm. they did uh, and talk to the person. Um, but I, I agree, I, I, I tend to hire many more physicists than sort of computational biologists myself. Uh, but it's just the label doesn't work anymore. I mean, just a quick comment there. And it's, um, you know, one of the things that I notice actually is that because you come from a physics perspective, you're generally more integrative than biology is. So, so for example, learning is studied in neuroscience. Uh, ecology is studied in ecology departments and evolution is studied in somewhere else. And if you look at the principles behind all of those things, they're basically the same. Uh, no, the detailed biology is, of course, very, very different, right? But, um, but one of the things that, that biological physicists are doing in areas like this is that they're importing concepts from immunology to neuroscience and from immunology to ecology and from ecology to evolution uh, and to produce a different way of thinking about these things, which is actually very subversive with regard to standard biology. And I think that's part of our job actually is to cause trouble in these ways. I, I somewhat agree with that, but I would caution, I, I think the biology, the, the biology community, even outside the biophys biological physics community, is doing that some of it. I mean, classically, there's the grand, uh, there's the modern synthesis, which was, you know, in the 60s was supposed to exactly do that, right? Take developmental biology, evolutionary biology, embryology, um, and early genetics and unify it under one approach. And that wasn't really driven by biological physics, that was driven by another use for synthesis. And I think you're right, there's a real strong need for synthesis. I agree that biological physicists can bring a lot of that or whatever we want to call ourselves. But I think the biology community does do that somewhat. I mean, remember the department that I was in was the Department of Integrative Biology. Um, and it wasn't just run by, by biological physicists. So I think there is some push on that um, on the biological side, especially on the modern biological side, um, even in there. Um, I was always impressed by it just being in the biology department of, of looking at that. Um, but I think it is a perspective that physics can bring and more. I think physics can bring the, the way that we do that we can bring in physics into that gives a very powerful perspective for doing that, especially if we can find commonality. The way we try to find commonalities, right, is through language and the language of mathematics as it relates to real systems. And I think that's something that uh, we more and more can do with biological systems across scales with the tools that we have. So in that part, I very, very much agree. On the super inspiring note of it's our job to cause a lot of trouble, uh, I am thanking you, Simon, again, on behalf of the audience and closing the record.